We're here doing a conference on courage. And as we've tried our best to define that for you by the lives of men and women in the Bible, but to summarize, courage is your deepest conviction translated into bold action. It's what you believe with all your heart and something you, you would risk your life for. You believe it that much. You treasure it that deeply. And then to translate that into bold actions. So important that we have courage in these days. You can amen me at any time. Amen. amen. <laughs> it takes courage to raise a family. It takes courage to live your, your standards in today's very confused culture. It takes courage at times to get out of bed on a Monday morning and go to work to a job that may not be your favorite thing to do on earth. It will take courage to finish an education to get to where you know God is taking you. It, you know, there's so many things that will, will require courage, but nothing more so than to live for Jesus Christ with all your heart. Yeah. And there's so many examples. We've limited uh, to just a few here in our time with you. We've talked about Joshua. We've spoken of, about the judges. And now I want to share with you a teaching about one of the greatest men ever to walk the earth. There are 106, 163 mentions of the name Paul in the Bible. 163 times the name Paul is in the Bible. But I'm going to share with you about a man whose name occurs 1,127 times. There is more in the Bible about this man's life than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob put together. We actually have more about this man than we have about Jesus Christ. God has really shown favor upon his life and has set him in front of us and as an example. I'm hope, hoping you're going to guess who it is, but I'll help you. It is a man after God's own heart. Fifty-four chapters mention him, not just mention him, but give us details about his life. Fifty-four chapters. And that's not counting the 75 Psalms that he has written. He wrote half of the book of Psalms. Many people think David wrote all the book of Psalms. No, he wrote about half of them. Moses actually wrote some of the Psalms. And Solomon also. And a guy that must look like Jason, his name's He-Man. He wrote one or two. So there's all kinds of different authors uh, in, in, of the Psalms, but David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. I find him as one of the most fascinating, intriguing men uh, in the Word of God, in all of human history. Perhaps never has there been a human being that walked the earth like David. He stands out above all others, and for one reason, he was a man after God's heart. He lived for the pleasure of God. He chased after the heart of God, and he killed 12 giants. I'm going to cover those 12 with you here this evening. Even though we may be here till sunup, I will cover those 12 giants tonight. He was a teenage shepherd. He was a male Shulamite. He's the clearest example of manhood in all the scriptures. I frequently get invited to speak to women because... Uh, the Passion Translation tends to touch the, the heart, and uh, the women get it, perhaps a little easier than some men. But I often, I likewise get to speak to men, and when I share with men for the first time, there's, it's going to be David, because he is the example of manhood. And every man in this room, listen up. This is the example given to us in the Bible. Of course, Jesus Christ. No one like him. We'd never exclude him. But as far as a, a, uh, a person that we can identify with, guys, it's this man, David. He was a giant killer, but he was the most tender, passionate man. He was a lover and a leader. There was something about him that was a mix of right and left brain. There was something about him that, that had the masculinity that drew some of the greatest champions of his day drew men to his side. It takes a leader to draw leaders to you. Yeah. It takes somebody, uh, you know, of, of, of caliber, of character, of integrity, and a champion.
to draw other champions. And believe me, David attracted men that you would want to, you'd want on your side. You wouldn't want them against you. I'll put it that way. They were champions, 37 of his mighty men. And out of those 37, there were three that distinguished themselves above the other uh, 34. So <clears throat> David was a leader. There was a champion inside of him. But I want you to think of, of a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old kid on the hillside of Bethlehem, tending sheep and plucking the strings of a harp. And there he composed Psalm 23, perhaps Psalm 19. Perhaps some of the other psalms were written in his youth like that. But there was this poetic person inside of this masculine, uh, the Bible calls him handsome, okay? So he, he was uh, attractive, and, and, and uh, yet he was a deep well. Something about him touched God. He even invented musical instruments. Did you know that? I don't know if you've ever done that, but David did. I mean, we play the keyboard, but like invent one? That's what David did. He invented harps and, and, and uh, lyres. I've been around a few of those guys before. But he, 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 he made musical instruments just to praise God. There was something within him that had to be released in worship and love and adoration for God. He truly was a lover. Yes, he was a fighter. But God doesn't say he killed all the giants. No, he said, he's a man after my own heart. Yeah. A thousand years after David's life, God still called him a man after my own heart. God's editing process is really gracious in our life. Yeah. When he looks at our life, he never defines us by our flaws. People do that, but God will never. And uh, you can just rest in that snuggle position with the living God. And David understood that. David leaned his heart. He, he must have been like John, the beloved. He must have been like that, you know, a deep well, very passionate. And, and indeed, his name, uh, Dod, the, the Hebrew uh, name, and etymologist argue to this day about the full meaning of what his name means because it's related to so many other different words, uh, you know. But the best I can come up with as a, a, a linguist who has studied this myself, I would say the best way to translate the name David, to interpret the name David, to the meaning of the name David is passionate. He was a passionate man. A related word, a cognate word from Dode is a pot boiling over, a, a, a seething, you know, the froth, what flows out from. That's one of the meanings of that word. There's something flowing about David. He was not static. You would have noticed him in the room for a number of reasons. But David was a man that lived for one purpose. When everybody else lived for themselves, David killed giants. And he lived for God. Yeah. Sitting there during worship, I was, I was uh, is it okay to read the Bible during worship? Yeah. I hope yeah. that's okay. Uh, I know we're supposed to worship. And I did. I did. I really did. But I, I was drawn to 1 Samuel 17 about David killing Goliath. And, and, you know, that's more than just a kid's cutesy, you know, children's ministry story. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. And, you know, this, this champion, Goliath, he was, you know, some, some scholars believe he was nine foot four, others nine foot nine. So somewhere between nine four and nine nine. All right, I'm six two. You're probably a, over six foot as well, Pastor Jason. And, and you know, it, it's really nice because I can see what you don't clean on top of your refrigerator when I come to your house. But that's okay. I still love you. But, you know, for somebody to be another three and a half feet taller than me, and his coat of armor weighed 125 pounds. I mean, there's, there's some, uh, maybe some Marines in here, and you've carried some pretty heavy packs. Bro, 125 pounds, just his armor. His, his uh, javelin, his spear, first of all, the, the wooden part of his spear was the size of a, a, a weaver's, you know, staff or loom or whatever you call it. Uh, I'm forgetting the word. 
But the head, the, the spearhead itself was 15 pounds. What a massive spear. I mean, it would, it would go through a concrete block, I'm sure. That's like a sledgehammer, a 15 pound, isn't it? Aren't there 12, 15 pound sledgehammer? I mean, imagine throwing a sledgehammer on the end of a spear. <sighs> this man was a champion. He was the intimidator, he was a terminator. And all of the Philistines were able to hide behind this champion from Gath. He was one of the Anakim. Anakim uh, is a race of giants mentioned throughout the Word of God. And they congregated. They took, the, the, uh, um, they took a city of Anak, and the Anakim were the giants that lived in that city. Do you know what the name of that city was changed to in the days of Joshua and Caleb? Hebron. Hebron is fellowship. And the giants you kill are those issues that are between you and fellowship with God that are going to hinder you, intimidate you, and come against you and tell you, you know, you can't get close to God. You're not a man after God. You're not a woman after God's own heart. You maybe sometimes intermittent like a windshield wiper. But, but fellowship with God, constant. Night and day, that's what I live for. How about you? To love him without an intermission. To pursue him. I, I have loved him for 49 years and I'm not about to stop now. I found him so faithful. Faithful to forgive, to pick me up, to be with me, to partner with me. To, and here's the, the weird thing, to use me. I just can't believe it that he would use me. He's answered my prayer as a 20-year-old as I came to know Jesus through the gospel message. The ABCs of the gospel, admit you're a sinner, believe in Christ, confess him as the Lord of your life, confess him as the, the, the Savior and Lord, and you will be saved. And I believe that message, Brother J. Milo Haynes at Newburgh Baptist Church preached while I was on leave from the military for a weekend pass. And he preached that sermon, and I ran to the front. I said, I want this man. I want Jesus Christ. Went back to the Army barracks that night and led maybe 10, 12 people, uh, troops, soldiers, to the Lord. And uh, another that many repented. They were backslidden and came to know the Lord. That was within hours of my conversion. I thought, oh, God, what are you doing here? I don't know anything. I, I don't even know John 3.16 yet. I didn't know nothing. I just knew ABC. I got my ABCs down. That was it. Admit that I was a sinner. <laughs> oh, yes. Believe that Jesus is the Savior that carried the cross for me, took my nails, bled to death so that I could live forever with him. I believe it. And then I confessed it publicly before him. And that, that's all I knew. But God was with me. Jesus stayed with me, gave me the dream come true of Candace Williams. Ha! Oh, she wasn't like teacher's pet. She was principal's pet. She worked in the principal's office, and she and I went to grammar school, middle school, and high school together. She'd never give me the time of day, and I don't blame her. I was off doing other stupid things. But God connected us. She was working in a law office, and, and uh, I didn't even have a car. I wrecked her car. <laughs> hit a train, or, or a train hit me. That's a story. It's not, what you, it's not what you think. I mean, the car literally stalled on a railroad track. Right, Candace? We hit the newspaper that day, didn't we? Yeah. Totaled the car, crumpled it up into a mess, and we walked out of that. The devil was trying to kill us after our honeymoon. We'd only been married six days. And it was a blind intersection. Anyway, I don't need to defend myself. I'll, I, I didn't, like, try to run. A, uh, that's not what I did, okay? Just so you know. I mean, I did a lot of bad things, okay? Lots of bad stuff. But I didn't do that. 
But I want to love him without an intermission. I want to pursue him all my life. We've, we've found him in the jungle. We've found him in the pastoral ministry as faithful, sufficient. And now as we're translating the scriptures and, and doing whatever we do, we find him faithful. Haven't you found him faithful? There's nobody that could take his place. He's all I want, right? All I need, all you want. And that's why you're here on a Sunday night, Saturday night. David was a musician and a mystic, a poet and a warrior. This teenage shepherd was anointed by the prophet Samuel to rule as a king. He was rejected. He was overlooked. I had an interesting phone call a while back. It was a producer of a full-length movie that's going to come out on the life of David. And I, I still, to this day, don't know how he got my number. I have no clue. But he called, and on the other end of the line, he said, I hear you've studied the life of David. I said, it's been my fascination for over 45 years. He said, well, we're going to do a movie, and I just want to ask you a couple things. Uh, is it true that David was an illegitimate son? I said, yes, he was. He was not the son of Jesse, and if you'll notice the text, Jesse's wife is never mentioned. He was the son of uh, a concubine, of the handmaiden of Jesse. And this was reason why his seven brothers wanted nothing to do with him because they were legit. He was like not in their minds. And they didn't even call David in to be with them when Samuel comes in. You remember Samuel lines them all up from Eliab to the, to the youngest. He lines them up. He looks every one of them in the eye and says, you're not the one. You're not the one. You're not the one. From the tallest to the shortest. And he got to the very end. And then he turned to Jesse, and he said the words that need to haunt the soul of every one of us today, as it's spoken as though from God himself through eternity, do you have another son? Is there another? And God is looking for another. Jesus is the firstborn. Come on. He's the firstborn of many. Do you have another son? Well, there's David. The guy out there with the sheep, the, the, the punk kid, go get him. Samuel wouldn't even sit down until David came in. As soon as David comes into the door, poof, oil pouring down his face and his head. You're the one. You're going to rule Israel. You're the king God has chosen. And the seething anger of his seven brothers had to be visible on their faces. God chose a teenager, anointed him with oil. David was anointed three times. Just because you get anointed once, can you like chill? I, I know you're anointed, but don't, you know, don't quite promote yourself yet until God does. David was anointed by Samuel. He was anointed by his brethren at Hebron. He was made the king over one of the 12 tribes. David says, should I go up and take the throne? Saul was already dead. Nobody was king. David knew he was anointed. He'd been anointed twice. Why would you ask? 99.9% .9 of us who are believers wouldn't ask. Bro, I've been anointed. I'm anointed of God. God, the prophet anointed me, called me out in a meeting, spoke that prophetic word over me. And then my own brothers anointed me. We just run right up to, to the, you know, walls of Jerusalem. We go right in there and take the throne. Not David. What a man after God's own heart. Should I go up and lead all the tribes? God said, not yet. What a man after the heart of God. David killed a giant, the nine-foot Six, nine and a half foot walking tree. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't wear the armor of Saul. Church will always try to put that armor on you. Just get under our covering, get in our denomination, get in our network, our Amway downline, you know, get in our apostolic deal. There's, there's so many hooks if you only could see it in the book of Proverbs, 
as he as the young man looked through the uh, the, the window and he, he saw the, 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 there was the prostitute that tried to pull and lure the young man in. It's a picture of the religious structure. Her Egyptian sheets. Egypt is always the world. Perfumed, the incense. They have all the denominational ducks in a row. We've got the anointing for you. Just come and lie with me. Just come and lay in this bed and we'll give you credentials. We'll give you a, a ministry. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. Book of Proverbs is all about two women. The prostitute and the virtuous one. And actually the book of Revelation centers around two, rev two uh, women as well. The harlot of Babylon. And the beautiful bride. The radiant bride coming out of heaven as the new Jerusalem. So David's foray, his first initial steps into notoriety was killing a giant. Now in private, he had worshiped, he had composed psalms, the inspiration and, and anointing of God had already come upon this young man. And he'd also killed a lion and a bear I don't know if you've done that this week lately. Is that on your resume somewhere? But it killed a lion and a bear. And he says, when, when they would come against my flock, I chased them down, snatched the lamb out of its jaws, grabbed it by the hair, and killed it. Man, this is, we're talking about a 16, now a 16, 17-year-old kid. Probably 15, 16 years old at this time. And in private, he had fought some battles. He had won against some demon spirits. He had won already in private. Your true life is who you are in private. Not in public, not what you project, not what you want to be. It's who you are, alone with God. So David rejected the armor of Saul, and he, he took instead a staff. He took a stick. And, of course, his shepherd's pouch, as he crossed the little stream there at the Valley of Elah, and I'm going to take you there, we'll actually walk in that stream, and you can pick up some rocks for yourself. They love it. The Israelis love it when you take rocks home. We got so many. Please take all you want. You'll find out what I mean when I take you there. There's rocks everywhere. He crossed that stream, and he went, and it says that he ran to face a giant. He ran towards his battle. That's courage. He didn't wait for Goliath to come after him. He went to where the battle was drawn. And this uh, giant man looks down at this mere boy. He says, am I a dog? Am I a dog that you send a kid after me with a stick? And then he cursed him in the name of his Philistine gods. And says, I'm going to tear you limb from limb, and the birds are going to come and eat your carcasses. And David said, uh-uh. You come to me yeah. with your shield, your staff, your, I mean, your, your spear. I come to you in the name of the living God. You're the one that's going to be dead lying on this field in but a moment. You see, it's a battle, of, it's a war of words, isn't it? Our spiritual battle oftentimes is, is whose word are you going to believe? The intimidator, the accuser, the liar, the one that rises up against you and, and says, I'm greater than your God. My, your problem is greater than God. That's what the devil wants to tell you. Your health issue, your family dysfunction, the issue going on in your business or career, it's greater than God can handle. Not for David. This boy... Saul was seven foot. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. And I've seen some really big Israeli guys, okay? So to be head and shoulder above the warriors, he was at least seven foot. At least seven foot tall. So if anybody should have gone out and fought Goliath, it would have been the king himself. But no, he hid there on the hill and wouldn't go down. But David did. What a champion. 
What a courageous champion. And the man after God's own heart hurled that stone in his sling and it pierced the armor because the Philistine helmets, I've done some research, they all had a piece that came down over their nose, on their forehead and their nose. That was an armor-piercing rock. <laughs> Went right through the armor and sunk into his forehead. He falls down, and David wins, uh, runs to him before the enemy could do anything. They're in shock, and he picks up this massive sword, and, and he whoops his head right off his body, severs his head. It rallied the Israelis, the troops of Saul, and they all raced down into the valley. And the Philistines chased them all the way to Gath, the gate of the city of Gath. And it says along the way, it was strewn with the carcasses of the Philistines that, that they had killed. David broke the principality over the land. And the principality over the land is intimidation. It's fear. It's whatever takes the courage out of your heart. Did you know David took Goliath's head? You know what he did with Goliath's head? Anybody know what he did with his head? He took it back to Jerusalem. He took the head all the way back to Jerusalem, buried it there. That's where Golgotha got the name, the place of the skull. Goliath and Golgotha come from the same Aramaic root word. It's related linguistically. Buried Goliath's head there. So the cross pierced Goliath's skull. Goliath is a picture of the mind of man that exalts itself, the high thoughts that exalts itself. Academia, scholarship. Who do you think? You don't know anything. Well, I know God. I know his goodness and his grace. And this mind of man is, is the, the biggest enemy to the advance of the church today. The principality God wants to slay is on your shoulders. God will use your sanctified mind. But if you live only in the soap opera, the drama of your head, you're going to be so frustrated and so defeated and so deceived. There's more in the Bible about deceiving yourself than there is somebody else deceiving you times two. There's twice as many scriptures about not deceiving yourself, being self-deceived, than there is of somebody coming and deceiving you. Isn't that interesting? So let's run through these 12 giants. Number one was Goliath. The first giant that David killed was Goliath. Number two, he had to kill the giant of rejection from his own family. If you don't think that's a giant, uh, well, uh, I'll help you understand. It is. It's a giant. His brothers didn't believe him. When David comes to the battlefield to kill Goliath, they mock him. They call him conceited, proud, with an evil heart. And here he is bringing food and, and, and stuff from home, you know, cheese and, and bread, and he's, he's coming with things to feed his brothers. So often the very one that comes to feed us, we turn on them. And that's what happened with David. His own brothers rejected him. So to finish my story, I just realized I didn't really finish it. The producer asked me about David, and I said, if you want to really capture the heart, the, the, the essence of a story that will touch the heart of everybody who views your movie, is take the angle of David being the most rejected outcast, wow. that he faced rejection his whole life. Wow. He was rejected by his brothers and family. He was rejected by Saul, whom he delivered and, and, you know, he would pluck the harp and demons would flee. He set Saul free many times. He would come when Saul was troubled and, you know, the demon spirits were coming at. They always 
come at leaders in an intensified way. And Saul would, the demon would attach to him, would start affecting him, and they'd call for David. Play that harp. Play that song again. And he'd just pluck, pluck a chord. He'd just strum, strum the harp. What anointing was on this man, David? And it would set his demonized boss free. Saul rejected him. His own brothers rejected him. The nation rejected him. They chased him. Do you know that, that Saul hired 2,000 paid assassins? Think of 2,000 Jason Bournes going after David. I mean, he had to hide. He'd hide in caves. He lived as a fugitive. There was a whole season of his life that he had to live out in the wilderness and, and the, the, the powers that be were, were hounding him. He was rejected even by his own mighty men at one period. And they wanted to turn on him and kill him. He was rejected by his wife just because he danced before the Lord. Over and over, this man pursued God in the face of rejection. If you have had rejection in your life, press your heart into God. Press your heart into him. Yes. The people in our village, when we got there, they, they, they may have jumped up and down, kill Brian, but I found out later it was because of the stuff that they wanted to get from us. They stole everything they could from us. If we left anything out at all in our hut, <laughs> where, you know, we turned around, it, it grew legs and walked right off. We would uh, do laundry, or uh, maybe I should say Candace would do laundry, and, and hang up the clothes to dry on a clothesline, turn around, and those clothes, they grew legs. They walked right off. Next day, I see them in pieces. Two of their kids would have one of my shirts and still have cloth left over. They were kind of small. And, and you know, they, they were not wanting the God that we came to represent until God moved in their heart. So rejection is a giant Fear, the giant of fear. It's a big one. Uh, we think we've overcome it until we find another giant stands in front of us. You have to have a default of courage in your heart that I will not turn back. I will not grow weak. I will not listen to the lies of the enemy. I will not succumb to the duplicitous ways of this world, to, to surrendering truth because Nobody else believes it. We cannot do that in the things of God. Fear must be a giant that is killed and slain. And with, with uh, David, no doubt when he ran towards this, this man, he's, you know, there had to be a little bit of common sense in him that says, what am I doing out here? <laughs> this guy has like a huge sword. He's got a shield. He's got armor. I've got a rock. But he overcame the fear. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you. He had to overcome identity issues. You see, here's a little secret you may not know about David. It was easier for him to kill Goliath than it was to take the throne of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, it says this, David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. So David conquered a giant. He conquered the Jebu stronghold. There would be no Jerusalem if it were not for David. David is the greatest figure in Israel's history. There would be no Jerusalem if it weren't for one man named David, who he and uh, his armor bearer went up the water shaft of the Jebu stronghold. You got to go up the water shaft of the word of God. He found a way to get into the stronghold and he conquered the, a stronghold that nobody could conquer. And he established a city and changed it from Jebus to Jerusalem. So he became greater and greater. He did all of these things. He was anointed. He was made uh, anointed as king. But it says the day came when David perceived that the Lord had established him as king of Israel. I don't know if you're following me. Let me try to make it clear. David had done 
exploits. He had been anointed three times, twice. And then it dawned on him, I really am a king. I'm the king. Yeah, you are, Dave. Come on. Get going, bro. And so may it dawn on you and me, the identity issues of our life, who you truly are, is not the sum total of your failures. It's not who your family says you are. It's not who your friends say you are. It's who God says you are. The giant of identity, that's number four. The fifth is self-love. He had to kill the giant of the applause of others. When he killed the giant, all the chicks were singing their song, man. All these beautiful gals, they would they'd come out and dance in, in front of David, and they'd say, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David huh, has killed tens of thousands. And they, all the women of Israel, the single women, the single girls, come on, saw this young adult, saw this young man, Realize the anointing, the, the charm of his life, the, 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 the allurement of the anointing of God when it comes on somebody. And they saw that and they sang his praises and it reached the palace and Saul was jealous. The Saul spirit, the religious system always is jealous of, a, of one more anointed than you being raised up underneath you. Can't handle somebody more anointed. When in fact, we've got to raise up those that have a thousand times more anointing. So he, David, it didn't go to his head. He didn't, you know, he didn't buy into the applause. Folks, it can be intoxicating. And Bishop Jason knows that it has taken out a lot of ministers and ministers, a lot who begin to believe that there's something that they're not, that it's them instead of the anointing. It's God's grace on them. And to begin to, you know, in a, in a pernicious way, to receive that applause and receive that affirmation and, and lauding of, of the masses, it didn't touch David's soul. He killed that giant. Many people buckle under criticism, but more are taken out by applause. And then, is it number six? Uh, honored leaders that opposed him. I mean, he, he, David killed the giant of, of being bitter towards a leader that didn't understand him. And again, this is a giant that will take out many people if their hearts are not right. David postured his life to honor Saul, even though the guy was throwing spears at him. <laughs> you know, spears in the Bible are always a picture of jealousy. And Isaiah 2 says the day will come when we will beat our spears into plowshares. Instead of using spears to throw at one another, we will beat them into harvesting instruments. We will use that energy and that zeal to bring a harvest. And we'll take our, um, we'll beat our, our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Instead, we'll prune the dead things of our own lives when jealousy rises up. You guys okay tonight? So don't be surprised if you are tested in the leaders that he puts over you. Flawed leaders, that you love your way through it and you respect and honor your way through that test and it will show that you have a heart after God as well. The seventh test, this is a big one. Oh, my, this is a giant, and it's waiting on God's timing, yeah. waiting for the timing of God. I already shared it, that David, after being anointed twice, he asked God, should I go up now and take the throne? Do you realize what this does to a man, that you have the opportunity to be a king, yeah. but out of God's timing? to do what you know God has already shown you that you're going to do, but you miss the timing? You must understand that the will of God and the timing of God are two distinct issues. Many will know the will of God. Few discern the timing 
of God. Just because you know God's will doesn't mean you know his timing. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. For us, the fullness of time is any time. But not God. He has a plan. And this plan, David submitted to it. He understood. He actually inquired. He wanted God to help him with the timing. What a man of humility. Is anybody else seeing it? I know, uh, you know, we had a busy weekend, but stay with me on this, guys. There's something about the heart of this man that if you embrace this, you'll not only get courage, you'll get favor. You'll get the favor of God. And then the opinion of others. Whatever number, somebody tell me what number is that? Is that eight? The opinion of others, the giant of opinions. What others think of you. That's a big one. You know, you, you do pretty good until you got everybody in front of you telling you, you know, telling you you're wrong. You got issues. You got this, and you're, you're this or that. But to be dead to the opinions of others, it's a giant. It's a giant you must slay with the living word of God as you pierce your heart with truth. Then you'll no longer be led astray by the lies nor the applause of the opinions of others. And it doesn't mean you get bitter. It doesn't mean you turn at them. And at times, the best thing to do is not defend yourself. Many times you'll be tested with information you have that nobody else has and how you handle that, even though it makes you look like the fool because you don't expose somebody. You don't uncover some, a brother, but instead you bear that fault. You, bear, you look like the fool in front of others rather than uncover somebody's wrong. That's a test. You're willing to be made a fool in the eyes of others? David did. The whole nation, anointed of God, but he's willing to be the fool. Number nine, mockery of those close to you, his wife. Because he killed Goliath, he got Saul's wife. He got Saul's daughter. Saul's daughter was given to David in marriage. Michal was her name. And she uh, mocked her husband as she saw him dance before the Ark of Glory. He brought the presence of God into the city. Amazing what David did. David bent time. David pulled the future into the present. He saw a grace revelation before many of us even get it. He saw mercy and a grace, the throne of grace, as the author of Hebrews states. And he saw this gracious throne as the mercy seat and that God should not be behind a veil and that God should have, everyone should have access by grace to this God. And the presence of the Lord was for all to enjoy and to draw near to. So David did not take the ark to Gibeah Gibeah is where Saul had set up the tabernacle. You understand, folks, that the tabernacle was on another mountain. It wasn't in Jerusalem. The tabernacle was on Gibeah. Temple hadn't even been built yet. Solomon built the temple. So all they had was the tabernacle. And over at Gibeah, a few miles from Jerusalem, was a hill where Saul had set up his headquarters. And Saul had the tabernacle, the outer curtains, you know, the bronze, lab the bronze uh, altar, the bronze uh, washing bin, uh, washing laver for the priest to be clean as they go into God's presence. And then the first veil, the first curtain, inside that curtain was the, the lampstand, the table of, of fellowship bread, and the golden altar of incense. And then there was this thick, heavy curtain that separated the holy from the most holy. And inside that curtain was nothing. David had the ark. They had the form. Which would you rather have? A form of godliness or the presence? Cherished presence in your life that you will not let someone rob uh, that from you. 
So David hijacked God. David kidnapped God and danced and brought him the ark, a symbol of God's presence. And where did he put him? In his backyard. He put God in his backyard. And he set up a little tent, a little hoopah, a little a canopy. No door, no veil. Anyone could come. And no doubt David spent many nights sleeping, laying there before the presence of the Lord, composing music, compo composing psalms. How many of David's psalms were written there as he was in within six feet of the ark of glory? I don't know, but I bet there were some. And God promises that he's going to rebuild that fallen tent of David. He doesn't say, I'm going to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. That's not what his plan is. But I will rebuild David's fallen tent. This, this tabernacle, this relationship that David had with me without a veil. That's what I want in the last days. I want men and women to come into my burning presence and, and gaze upon my beauty and my glory and, and be one with me in this realm of union. That's the tent of David that I'm going to reestablish on earth. But his wife saw him from the window and saw her husband. And please, please don't ever say David danced in his underwear. No. Ah. Uh -uh. He had the linen garment of a priest. David was a king who wore a priest's garment and got away with it and brought this ark. I mean, this whole picture is so taboo. It's so breaking the mold. It's so not allowed in Judaism. He broke laws. He broke culture. He broke all kinds of traditional taboos. And here he comes bringing God's presence. And what did he do? He would dance. You know, I know you want me to, to do that. but Come on, baby. Come up with No, that's okay. And he'd dance, and no doubt he'd kick up his, his heels, his legs, and, and maybe some of his thigh got revealed or something. But, but his wife, looking down the window, mocked him. And she became barren that day. Listen, my friend. Churches that don't let worship thrive will have no conversions, growth. They're barren. The best thing is to let, to honor Jeff and Suzanne and, and the team and Jonathan and, and the bass player <laughs> and, and all the cats up here and let them do it. Come on. More. I'll even be more undignified. Hey. Hey. David had to overcome. The mockery of those who didn't understand his passion. Let me say it clearly. Live up to the reputation your family has already put on you. You're the fanatic. Live up to that. Be more of a fanatic. They've already pasted you with that. So be the fanatic that they're, you know, your family, oh, stay away from that one. She's just weird. One of these religious people. I mean, she goes to church all the time. Probably gives money in the offering and, you know. Well, you're going to have a giant to kill when it's your own loved ones. And some of you know exactly what I mean because it's, it, it's divided your own home. And it's painful. And it hurt David, but he overcame it. He killed the giant of the mockery of loved ones. Number... Ten. He admitted his sin. Yeah, he blew it. When kings should have been out to war, David stayed home. You see, a passive spirit always opens you up to further darkness. And you know the story. Bathsheba was having her mikvah there. and uh, They've actually uncovered the city of David, and they've uncovered David's palace. And I know I'm giving you an infomercial, but if you would come with me to Israel, you'll stand at the very place, and we'll cover our eyes, but that's the very place where he no doubt looked down on the, on the, the you know, the, the uh, place below, and there was Bathsheba, one of his great warrior's wives. 
And he not only committed adultery, but he committed murder. He plotted a, an evil thing. And one of his loyal men, and the story is just like, ugh, made for a movie, but R-rated. And, and what David did, it was wicked. But when the, a prophet came, exposed his sin, pierced his heart. And the giant of the self-defense of, I'm the king, I'm better than all of you. No. The sword of truth pierced his heart and he confessed. There's two Psalms in the Bible. Psalm 51. And Jason's going to help me with the other one. Is Psalm, is it 30? With David's confession, Psalm 51, Psalm 32, uh, blessed are those who are forgiven. Yeah. Psalm 30, thank you. Uh, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, he, he wrote inspired scripture to confess sin. And you know, there are believers today that don't think you need to be real and confess and admit your sin. Yeah. No, they'll fight me if I, if I, maybe be somebody here. No. You win. <laughs> But there is a place. Confess your faults one to another, James yes, writes. Yes, yes. And I don't know that the Catholics have it right, but it is good to confess to one another. Sure to be honest. Yes. Be real. You're never going to be rebuked by God when you come clean right. and when you right. acknowledge your guilt. And that's a giant that holds people back. They'd rather cover it. They'll, they'll drown it with alcohol or they'll hide it. They'll hide their promiscuous affair the best they can. It's amazing how God has a way of uncovering these compromises. David, when confronted, acknowledged his sin. Will you? Will you come clean? Will you admit the areas of darkness in your heart, the hiding places where you don't hide in God, you hide in your darkness? And come clean in those and let him Breathe grace and breathe life. He, he's trustworthy. If he's really as good as we say he is, then he'll be good when we acknowledge our guilt. And we say, Lord, cleanse me. Purify my heart. Search me. One of the wildest prayers ever prayed is David's prayer. Search me, O oh God. Test me. Test my heart. Search it down to deep. See if you find any wickedness in me. How could he pray a prayer like that? Because he knew what God would do if he found wickedness. He would pluck it out of his heart. He would cleanse him and he would heal him. Lead me in the way everlasting. For you are my redeemer and my strength. This is a giant that David killed. That takes me to 11... David killed the giant of curses spoken against him. There's an episode in David's life, a sad episode. His own son, Absalom, that turned on him. David, some of, there's a handful of psalms that were written in that, that uh, period, that dark period of David's journey. And you've gone through pain like this. If not... God bless you. But David was betrayed by those that loved him or should have loved him. Those nearest him turned on him. Not only his own men at times, but his own family. And Absalom tried to compete with his... I, I, I don't even get it. I mean, this is David. This is David. Don't you realize, Israel, what you have? You have a king who's close to God. You have a man that's been tested and proven that's killed giants after giants who has a character that runs as deep as the mightiest river. There's something noble, exalted, pure about this man that's been sifted many times. And yet, his adult son turned on him, Absalom. And David went into exile the very city he established from the palace he had built, from those that 
once sang his praises. And you know, he walked the very path in reverse that Jesus came in, from Gethsemane into Jerusalem. And walking down the path, Shimei cursed him. He was one of Saul's relatives, descendant of Saul, and cursed David. And from the ledge above, threw stones and dirt, spit on him, cursed this wicked man, David. Abner takes his sword. David says, no. No. It may be God raised him up to rebuke. You tell me a man like that. It goes so against the grain of the male heart, of a leader's heart, of anybody's heart, to be cursed like that. He killed that giant. He didn't kill Shammai. He killed the thing in his heart. That would, try, that would be embittered, that would, that would send one of your mighty champions. I mean, David was surrounded. You talk about, like, secret service guys. I mean, he had, he had crack troops. He had the special forces. He had some of the wildest, bravest, courageous powerhouse guys around him. All he had to do is flip his fingers, click his fingers, and, and Shimei would be cut in pieces for cursing the king. That's a giant. And here's the last. We'll go home. Uh, let me try to, before I finish this, let me try to jump ahead to my point is that God is giving us a preview of Jesus, the son of David. He's giving us insight into the heart and life of Jesus Christ through a, a guy you can touch. I mean, a guy you could hang with, uh, you know, a human. I mean, we, Jesus was human, but he was God too, so we kind of feel intimidated. But David is like us, but not really. <laughs> the last giant... He kept his promise. You know what the promise he kept was? A vow to Jonathan. And after David's enemies were killed and he was restored back to his throne and life was really humming, it was just going smooth, David thought about his friend. You ever lost a friend? He thought about Jonathan. So he called and he said, is there a descendant of Jonathan? Is there any of Jonathan's family that I could show mercy to? You know who it was? Mephibosheth. Say that 10 times fast. You've spoken in tongues. <laughs> Mephibosheth, when uh, Jonathan and his father Saul were killed on Gilboa Mountain, the, the, uh, the nurse or the child care person that was caring for the five-year-old Mephibosheth, she dropped him and fled. Uh, we don't know exactly if she dropped him accidentally or if she purposely just dropped him and ran, but Mephibosheth, as a five-year-old boy, uh, had a severe injury that never healed, and he was crippled. Mephibosheth was crippled. David said, bring. I want to keep my vow. I want to keep my promise. Boy, it's a man of integrity that will keep a promise. When the guy's already dead. And Mephibosheth lived his whole life with shame. On a number of levels. The name Mephibosheth means from the mouth of shame. That's what his name means. And David brought him in. 
brought in this cripple. I said, You're gonna, I'm going to adopt you. You're going to be mine. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to show my faithful love to Jonathan by showing it to you. And you're going to sit at my table. You're going to eat my food. You're going to be right next to me. And he, he became part of the royal family and lived in the palace. What a grace message, you know, to sit at the table of the king. Is there any Mephibosheth in this room? You had a fall. You haven't walked perfectly. And from the mouth of shame, you've embraced words spoken over you. But one greater than David, son of David, sits on David's throne, who has the key of David, the root and offspring of David, who has the horn and authority of David, brings us to his table, the Lord's table. And we get a feast with him. David was a giant killer. And I hope this short lesson on the life of David will give you some things to ponder about character, about our lives, that we would be as as clean in heart as David was. So take these giants and kill every one of them. Don't fall. Don't stumble. And if you do, don't worry. The God of David will be your redeemer. The faithful one who wrote Psalm 107. The faithful one whose mercies endure forever. And God will restore you. Would you stand please? Lord, I'm I'm challenged by Samuel's words. Do you have another son? Can't there be another one like Jesus? That you won't rest until you have us all, until you possess us, until you conquer every pocket of darkness, every corner filled with cobwebs in our character, in our heart. Win those battles in secret and private. Win them in me. Give me grace to fight my battles in the presence of the one I love. I ask for supernatural power and grace to fall upon this beautiful congregation, upon this church, upon the church family, the church leadership, every servant leader in the house, every boy and girl everyone watching online, everyone hearing me tonight. Lord, that we would pursue the life of Jesus as much as we pursue the power of his kingdom. We want to lay hold of eternal life. We want to lay hold of the victories of the cross. We want to lay hold of the supernatural grace that has no limit that will change and transfigure us until there is another son, a daughter, a son, a lookalike, a bride fit for a king, prepared, robed, crowned, enthroned. Finish that work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great word, amen? Listen, I also want to let you know that uh, Pastor Brian and Candace are going to be with us tomorrow for our Kingsway College graduation and our regular service. It's going to be an incredible time. How many of you are planning on being with us tomorrow? Come on, it's going to be incredible. If you are visiting with us and you don't have a local church, we encourage you to come. But also, if you're visiting from the area, we encourage you to be present at your local church. Um, trust me, your pastors appreciate that support. And honestly, you're, there's, a, there's a part of your congregation that's missing when your piece is not present. Amen? 
but it is going to be an incredible time tomorrow again with them bringing not only the main word to our church, but also a commencement address to our students as a practical uh, announcement for tomorrow. We're actually going to have uh, a few rows in the center section reserved for our students. I know some people like their seats. Hallelujah. But we really want to make sure that we're able to have our students in the center section because of what's going to be happening with their walk to be able to honor them. And again, for that charge and that commencement. And so when you get here tomorrow, and if there is a name on your seat, that's why. So we ask you just to give grace that Sunday, and you can have your seat back next Sunday. Amen. I love you so much. Listen, uh, Tiffany and the team are going to be available at Brian's book table. I'm going to ask tonight if you could allow Brian and Candace to slip out. Uh, They've poured out a lot today, and we want to make sure that they get rested this evening so we can be fresh tomorrow. Amen. Enjoy your night. God bless. We're so glad you're able to join us online for this service at Kingsway. We pray you are blessed, encouraged, and empowered through this broadcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date with our latest content. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can like, comment on what impacted you, and even share with your friends. No matter which platform you are using, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at testimony at kingswayal.com. We are so excited to hear what God is doing in you. We really are, and we're grateful for all the things that are happening in and through the family of Kingsway. We want you to know we love you, we're praying for you, and we bless you to walk in the fullness of who you're called to be. We'll see you next time.